What's up? What's up? I love that song. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, 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 what a boom, boom. All right, I'll turn it down. I'm sorry. What's up, everybody? First of all, uh, I got the chat up. Let me know if you can hear me. I always like to make sure that you guys can hear me before I proceed because I always got something. I always got something messed up. So let me know if you can hear me. Okay, yes, Adam says you can hear me. Audio is good. I can hear you. All right. Sorry for the delay. Uh, also, I want to apologize. My uh, nicer camera that is not just like a regular web camera, which is what you're seeing me on now, my uh, little uh, nicer camera that I usually use is on the fritz tonight. Well, it's been on the fritz for a couple of days, and it's uh, not doing something correctly, and I can't fix it yet. So that's why we don't have that tonight. But anyways, uh, I hope you guys... Let me move this down. It's so annoying. Anyways, I hope you guys are doing great tonight. I hope you guys have had a good week. I hope that you guys are going to have a great week starting tomorrow. Uh, I'm pretty excited about tonight. Let me, uh, let me move this window over here and this one over here so I can see your questions. So I can see your questions a little bit better. All right. Looks like Parker's here. Awesome. Uh, I'm pretty excited tonight because, uh, first of all, I'm going to give you a little uh, what's going to happen tonight. Uh, last week, we started the concepting for the October Halloween deck, which is called Overbite, which is it's going to be a fun deck of monsters and monsters. Um, and I had... Uh, we kind of concepted the tuck case for that and kind of what that was going to be. And I had mentioned last week, uh, um, I had mentioned last week that we were going to possibly work on uh, that, the October deck, uh, tonight as well. But I have some updates on that. It's still going to happen. Don't worry. Don't get scared. It's going to happen. Uh, but because of the complexity of the tuck case being that it's like one tuck case over another tuck case over a box, uh, because of that complexity, uh, I'm still waiting uh, to get some uh, template files back. Excuse me. Uh, I'm still waiting to get some template files back from my box manufacturer, the, the people that are making the box and the tuck cases. Uh, and it's... I just have learned from experience in the past that it's stupid to start to do uh, artwork on something, especially artwork that's dependent on a die line like this is going to be. Uh, it's stupid for me to start that artwork before I've got some semblance of a template to work from, and I do not have one yet. And so, uh, and so that's kind of why we're not going to do that tonight because I'm still waiting for that. But the good news is, in consolation for that, tonight is going to be the very first time that I start concepting and working through, uh, st where I start working through some of the, s let me try to form English sentences. Uh, tonight is going to be the first time that I get my ideas from my brain's mind's eye onto uh, digital paper, I guess you could say, and uh, of Beowulf, which is going to be the November deck. And let me turn on my other little monitor so you can see what's going on. All right, so I'm going to show you some of the... Uh, so anytime I do a new deck, uh, one of the things that I... Uh, uh, one of the things I tell my crew, um, and Parker can attest to this, one of the reasons, one of the, the I have two pillars, uh, two pillars to my business, basically of, in terms of the content that I create and the products that I create. And the two pillars of my business are community and storytelling. Uh, and obviously community is what we're doing now. 
uh, this is a way for me to build community with you guys and for you guys to be a part of the creative process of what is King's Wild. And so that's the community pillar. It sounds way more more fancy than what it is when I say the word pillar, but whatever. And then the second part of that, the second pillar of King's Wild is um, uh, care, uh, storytelling. Uh, and I love storytelling. And at, at my most, at the root of everything that I do artistically, if you ask me what I was, like you ask somebody, it's like a graphic designer. What do you do? Oh, I'm a graphic designer. Or if you ask somebody that's like a musician, I'm a musician. If you asked me what I was at the most basic level, uh, I would say I'm a storyteller slash illustrator. And an illustrator, what an illustrator is, is someone that tells a story with pictures. And so I really feel like that. What's, that's what I am and that's what I really have a passion to do. And so that's why it's one of the pillars of my, my, whole, my whole business and whatever and all the products that I create. And um, and the more and more decks that I do that are themed after a story, I just personally am more inspired and intrigued and ultimately engaged in them. And I have found that I do my best work when I have all those kind of things. When it's a story, when I'm engaged and inspired. And I've done some decks that don't necessarily tell a story that not that I didn't like them how they ended up but I just haven't been as engaged and as inspired by them so I'm I am finding myself doing more and more thematic story type stuff and that's one of the reasons why originally when I was starting out um why am I showing my computer I'm not I'm not showing anything yet that's why originally when I kind of was was rough drafting all the decks for this year the November deck I had slated as what was called the oil slick. And it was basically just like a deck that was, and I may still do that. I may still do the oil slick deck, but it was kind of a deck that was really just based on an artistic style or, or like a, a an era of packaging from like vintage oil cans and uh, from like the 50s and 60s. Very much like the King's Wild Tigers is not a story deck, but it is a deck that is specifically inspired by an era of packaging design from like the early 1900s of like matches, matchbooks. Now, I like those decks. I love doing those decks. They're a lot of fun. But I really consider those decks practice because I feel like that my, I feel like that my best work is done when I'm doing um, a story deck that is wrapped in some kind of uh, artistic style. Uh, because that's what an illustrator does. An illustrator has to be kind of like an artistic chameleon and uh, be able to do lots of different styles because, you know, historically an illustrator uh, was a very commer- is a commercial type thing where you have to do whatever the client wants and, and the clients is, and the clients are going to always want different artistic styles and to tell different stories. And so that's my background. Uh, and so that's why a lot of the stuff that I do is very different in style and look and I love that because I think that that just keeps me honing my craft and keeps me getting better uh, at what I do um, and so for Beowulf now I'll show my picture my uh, screen now for Beowulf uh, like I said uh, the story is Beowulf and the artistic style is kind of a melding of two uh, of two of two th- of two things, uh, like with Robin Hood, Robin Hood was uh, was very specifically based on the 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 bow tapestry from like the 11th century, and it's a tapestry that was created right around the Anglo-Saxon, like the uh, the Norman invasion, like 1066 and that kind of thing. So it was a tapestry that was right around that time. And that's what Robin Hood is based on, and I love. Anglo-Saxon history, I love, uh, you know, Nordic history, Scandinavian history, all those types of Viking type things. I love all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, and that's, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I like Lord of the Rings so stuff. That's why I'm kind of drawn to Lord of the Rings because, I mean, Tolkien, J.R. Tolkien, his, I mean, his favorite story ever was Beowulf. And so, and he draws a lot of, you know, iconography and, and stories from that whole kind of ancient 
Anglo-Saxon kind of Britannia and uh, Scandinavia. And so the two, the two things that I'm really grabbing onto, I'm going to pull my Pinterest page up here, are uh, in like Norway and Scandinavia and those types of uh, Nordic countries, uh, they had these uh, things called stave churches, which I don't know, you may or may not know what a stave church is, but it's just, it's basically like a, 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 a church and they were, they were made of wood and they were really, really cool. But one of the things that these stave churches all had were these really intricate uh, wood carvings, and this is a this is a uh, this is from a doorway from a, a stave church in Norway, and it's it's a it's a excerpt from a bigger uh, a bigger like around the door they would tell a story. In this specific story, it's I don't know if I have any pictures. Let me see if I can find a picture of it. So here's a good picture. Well, that's not the one. Let me see. Here we go. Uh, the entire story around this this door frame. These guys are two like blacksmiths, and they are forging a sword. And around this twi- you know, around this time, like this is a 12th century, like this is a 12th century church. I mean, during that time, like like sword making was like you had a, the only people that had swords were like or like nice swords were like the nobles and royal people and stuff like that. And it was very much a status symbol, for sure. I mean, most of the people were fighting with, like, you know, farm equipment, because that's what they were. But this uh, this story around this doorway kind of tells the story of these blacksmiths, and they're creating this sword, and they're, you know, there's one, I can't remember, like, I can't, let me see if I can find it. There's a, where they're, like, hammering it on an anvil, like here's the one. This is a drawing of the wood carving, but they're hammering it on an anvil and forging the sword, and it and it goes all the way to where the sword that they forge is being used, uh, used in battle. And I think that's really cool, and that that really plays towards the stuff that I like in terms of like storytelling. Um, and so this is kind of the style. This is kind of the artistic style that I'm uh, le- that I'm gonna gonna go with with this. Um is this kind of 12th, you know, 12th, 9th, whatever. It's very, very, you know, it's very circa this year uh, kind of a thing in terms of like this Nordic wood carving. Here's the, here's the, this is the image of the sword finally getting used in battle and killing this guy. And look at this. These little wavy lines are like blood coming from the back, the back wound and coming out of his mouth. And I'm going to definitely use that kind of wavy uh, stuff. And then the second thing, that uh, I'm looking at is the, uh, let me pull it up here, is the Anglo-Saxon helmet uh, that was found in Sutton Ho. And Sutton Ho is a, I want to say, 5th and 6th century. So this is, we're talking old. I mean, old in the grand scheme of Britannia and those kind of things. Uh, Sutton Ho was a burial mound, a burial site, uh, that they found this really cool helmet. Let me just pull it up. Beowulf reference images. Uh, here we go. Open. Where'd it go? There we go. So this is the Sutton Hole helmet. You've probably this is a pretty this is a pretty well known image and a, a well known thing. Well, I guess it is for people that like study art and stuff like that. And I remember studying about this in art school and that kind of thing. Uh, and then this, these are some of the uh, these are some of the detailed. Uh, images on the helmet itself so very rudimentary stuff uh, but these are some of the images on Sutton Hole look at this horse like riding over uh, somebody I think that's awesome but anyways so the so what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to be thinking about this art style uh I'll be thinking about this art style, this kind of uh, Nordic, Scandinavian uh, wood carving with the story of Beowulf. And I'm, I'm going to start sketching uh, uh, Beowulf himself. So he'd be the king of spades because I always kind of start with the king of spades. That's just kind of something I do traditionally. I always start with the king of spades. And uh, I'll be thinking about that, be looking at the reference as I'm doing it, and what I'm going to do is, the ultimate goal is to create, 
the card or create the design that's going to go on the card. Uh, you know, and if we look at this image, you know, I'm going to create the King of Spades, Beowulf. In my head, I'm going to have him with Grindel's uh, arm in his hand. And because the first, you know, the, the, when they, when they meet Grindel for the, when Beowulf meets Grindel for the first time in the meat hall, uh, he's naked because he was getting, he was getting ready for, he was getting ready to go to bed and he was, and he wanted to like, if you've ever read the story of Beowulf, he know everybody knows that Grindel's coming that first night that they're, that they're there at Rothgar's, uh, meat hall. And, and Beowulf's pretty cocky and, Beowulf was like, I mean, he didn't say it like this in the book, but he's like, or in the story, he was pretty cocky, and he was like, I'm not going to fight this guy. I'm not going to fight Grindel with weapons and with armor because Grindel knows those things and knows those fighting styles and stuff like that. But really, he was cocky, and he was like, I'm going to I'm gonna fight this Grindel thing. You know, without a better way to say it, I'm going to fight Grindel butt naked with no armor, no helmet, no weapons, uh, because I'm Beowulf, you know, I'm going to do this. And so obviously I'm not going to draw him naked, but he's not going to have a shirt on, but he won't have a helmet. He won't have even that kind of like a, his chain mail, because that's one of the things they talk about in the story is like this glistening chain mail. Um, and so he's going to have Grindel's arm in his hand and I'm going to use some of this kind of, uh, these like wavy lines that represent kind of like blood or vomit, that kind of thing coming off the arm. I think it's going to be cool. And so once I have the sketch, if I have enough time, I've got some wood textures that I think they're going to work. But then I'm going to take that drawing and then I'm going to put it onto wood and make it look like, well, the, the, the idea is to make it look like it's a wood carving, actual wood carving like this reference, Im this reference image that I've been showing. And I think it'd be pretty sweet. So that's what we're going to do. Let me just check and see if i got any specific questions I need to ask see here i think we're good i'm gonna just go ahead and start okay so let me get a little closer sorry i have to get really close to the camera but it's on top of my monitor so that's how we roll i'm just gonna make a new layer here uh okay we're good all right let me see here so if you have any questions feel free to ask them and uh parker or myself will answer them but I usually kind of zone out when I start to draw. So the first thing that I do when I'm drawing this, I just kind of kind of think about how I'm going to compose compose the uh, the the cards. And one thing that I want to look at, one thing that I'm thinking about is in these in these stave church wood carvings they were normally around a door. So like this is a good, let's see if it goes to a page or not somewhere. Yeah, there we go. So like this is a good example of how these carvings were around the border of a door. Okay. And so I think that lends itself really well to a playing card. Like there's another example of it being around a door. Um, and so what I'm thinking about is in terms of the playing card, if... I'm going to divide it up in like little quadrants or not quadrants, but sections. So like I'll have a section here for, you know, the letter and it may not be that big like that. And then what I'm thinking about doing is to mimic this kind of style where it's surrounding the door. I'm probably going to create two columns like this come down like this and then this will be like uh like a, a knot or the kind of scroll work that you would see in these images here like this type of not this this is more acanthus leaves but kind of like this uh, stuff like this around these kind of scroll work and stuff like that that I showed you guys. Sorry, this is... I kind of, I'm always kind of wary of just clicking on stuff while I'm on live because I have no idea where it's going to send me. But it'll be kind of this kind of knot work on the side. And then the... Uh, and So I'm going to duplicate this layer because I'm going to have that on the other side. 
like that. And then the, <coughs> excuse me, I get a drink of water. And then this middle part will be where I have the uh, character. So the sides will be this knot work here. And then the, the, the center part will be the character like this as the wood carving. And what I'll probably do is create a specific suit knot work. So like all the spades will have a specific knot work on the side. I did this very similar. I did something very similar to this in my Ethereum, my Ethereum deck where I had a, a knot work that was suit specific. So all the spades had a, a knot work and I'm going to do the same thing here. So I'm going to delete all this and I'm just going to draw it again in a, a little bit more specific way. And I'm just going to give myself some kind of rudimentary boundaries to stay within. All right, so there we go. There's that. And then I'll have a top line and a bottom line. All right, so... So this is kind of my my boundaries of which I'm going to stay in, or I'm going to try to stay in. Uh, and then I may add a line. I may add, let's add a line here. Maybe this is where I'll put, like, the suit. Let's just say spades. And the K for king. And then let me just duplicate that around so I've got that. All right, now I've got my, my framework. Now I'm going to just start drawing. So in my head, this is going to be Beowulf. He's not going to have any armor. He's naked. Um, he's going to have Grendel's arm in his hand. It's going to be awesome. So now I look at this. Uh, this is very kind of similar to, uh, let me go back to my reference images because I always like working from reference images. There's one image that I like a lot on the Pinterest or on my Pinterest page. Let's see here. That where to go? This was, uh, this one. I like this. I like this kind of style of face, and so I'm going to copy. Let me see if I can open. Let me open image in a new window. Okay, good. I'm gonna copy. I'm gonna paste. Oops. I'm going to paste this image in here. And I'm just going to... Uh, I want to keep most of it because I like... I want to keep their heads and they're kind of the shape of their heads. And I also want to keep their hands because that's one thing that I like to really kind of really mimic. I did that with Robin Hood and I really tried to mimic the way they did the heads, the heads and the hands. Um... Uh, see here all right here we go so for Beowulf let's see notice how they have a kind of these pointy heads that's a helmet obviously and I'm just going to start for Beowulf he's going to be move this out of the way bring down the opacity a little bit more so it's not so much in my way but what I'm thinking is we'll have his head here and I'm going to have him looking down because I like the way this guy's looking down instead of just having him looking straight because he's going to have he's going to have Grendel's arm in his head in his in his hand. And one thing I like about the way they did their heads is they would have this kind of the top of their head and then the bridge of their nose kind of just came down straight. This guy's got a little bit of a brow. But I really like that look where the where the the head just goes the crown of the head goes straight into the nose. So I may do like a, a little mix of both. And then he'll have his beard, his little sharp beard with his stash like that. And then we'll give, we'll give him some long hair like that. And then his neck. And then one thing I want to look at is the shoulders kind of mimic that. So we'll come down like this. 
And a lot of these images um, are in profile. So they didn't have very many, like, they did have some, but a lot of these images like this one here, everything's in profile. Uh, because it's way easier, it's way easier to carve wood uh, and make things if you're doing like a profile. It's just, because it's so hard, it's it's a lot harder to do something like three quarters and give it depth in carvings. Trust me, I know. But it's hard to do that in carving, so it's just easier to do it in profile and still have it make it feel like it's in, in uh, a little bit of depth. Depth. Uh let me see here. Let's see. Now, and I'm looking at his hand. I'm looking at these hands. So this one will just come up like this. Just draw the hand real quick. And then Grendel's hand is going to be, I'm going to make Grendel's hand much bigger because Grendel's, you know, Grendel's monster. You know, he's the bloodline of Cain. And so, he'll have like these really gnarly fingers. Like this. And then, like that. That'd be cool. And then, maybe it's like his forearm. This is all real rough. And then, Obviously, it's ripped out of its socket, so maybe there's a bone. And then I'll do that blood coming down like that. Uh, and the cool thing is, is like, that's, I mean, that's a big part. That's basically a lot of it. Now, let's do, let's bring his other hand up behind it like he's grabbing it with both hands. Like that. I don't know. There we go. Now, I do have to think about this part of the arm in here is definitely going to come past the, the midline. So I need to make sure that I'm going to have to be aware of that. And I'm going to have to redraw some stuff. So just scale it up a smidge. I really want it to be tight. I want it to be tight in that area. But I'm already crossing the midline. So I should probably draw my midline so I know where it's at. All right, there's my midline. Let me center that up. Control A, V for move, center. There we go. Control J for duplicate, Control T. I don't know why I'm telling you the hotkeys, but I am. Control E to merge. <laughs> it's, like a, it's like a tutorial video. Control J, Control. All right, so, so now we got his elbow. I want to make sure that his elbow stays above that midline. And let's go ahead and duplicate. No, I don't want to click that. Control J, Control T. I'm going to pull this around just to get, well, crap. There we go. Oh, yeah, this is going to be awesome. This is going to be really good. This is going to be really cool. I already know it. All right, so let's merge these together. I'm super excited about this. I, 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 I yeah, this is going to be sweet. All right, so, all right, I'm just going to, I'm going to make that opacity I'm going to bring that opacity down, and then I'm just going to draw. I want to bring this over here that I can see it because I really like these guys. I'm going to bring, I'm going to take down the the border just because I don't want it to mess. I want to be able to see that uh, reference, and I'm going to take down the, the dial line. I don't want that stuff to be bothering me visually because I kind of know where, I know what size I need to do it, and now I just have to draw it. I just want to be able to see the drawing, see it. All right, so uh, one thing I want to look at is how they did the eyes. I think that's very important, and you can see here that they had these, they did the eyes kind of like these, they start way back in their head, and it's almost like this teardrop shape like that. Or with this other guy, see how it starts way back here, almost at their temple, and it comes in. And it's like this shape. Then you got his nose and then his uh, his mustache. And one thing I want to show you, like, it's just, I, I think it's interesting. Like, if you look at the shape of this guy's mustache, it's very similar. I don't know if I have it up still. 
uh, it's very similar to the Sutton Ho helmet. So notice how notice how this shape of the mustache is very similar. And I just think that that's, I think it's worth noting, at least. Worth noting. All right, so let's do his forehead, make a new layer. So I'm going to bring here. There's his head. And then bring his hair back. And notice how it's one piece here, but then they show the hair by just doing the lines. And so that's something we'll do within the uh, the the wood carving. So, and also, notice how they would draw the ear, and then the jaw line would connect to that ear. They do it with this, so there's the beard line, right, to connect to the ear. And you can't really see this one's ear, but you can see here's the ear, and it connects with that jaw line. So that's another little... That's another little thing I want to make sure that I get in there. Like that. And then I'm going to give him more of a, I call it a warrior's nose. It's more of a, it's like he's broken his nose a couple of times. And so he's got a little bit of a, this ridge right there. I just think it's more of a, more of a, you know, manly nose. Like he's broken it. And then we'll do his mustache, that kind of that kind of shaped mustache that they have, bottom lip. And also, I keep I keep wanting to reference that Sutton Ho. Notice how the the bottom lip is just like an arc. I like that. And so we're gonna do that similar thing here. And then the bottom of the beard. And then the beard here. We'll connect like that. And then we'll end up having lines for the beard. There's the hair. Neck. Let me see there's somebody asking questions. Uh, you guys are talking about VHS when I'm trying to do Beowulf over here. I'm not mad. Because I want you to buy VHS too. So talk all, talk all you want. So here's what I'm talking about. That big teardrop shaped eye. Starting way back at the temple. And then, like this, there's that. And notice, notice if you can see this, you have the teardrop, but then instead of, instead of, so you have the teardrop here and then the shape, instead of doing like the iris here where it goes all the way to the top and then they do the pupil, uh, if you can see it, I don't know if you can see it or not, I could zoom in. Uh, the way, they're, way that they do this that I like is with this one, it's like this, the eye, and then the iris is like this. And it look and it's looking down, you can see like the whites above the eye. Same thing with this. You can see that carve right there where it's like that. It's very buggy, buggy looking, but that's something I want to make sure I get in there. Let me see here. Just I'm gonna make this more of a circle. And he's gonna be down and, he, and I want him to be looking at this arm too. Because, I mean, come on. He just ripped off Grendel's freaking arm. He's a, I mean, he's the boss. The Danes are, like, looking at him like, holy moly, what is this Beowulf guy just coming in on a ship from the ocean with his 13 companions? All right. So, uh, it, it's easy. It's, it's really a lot easier to draw because I don't have to draw any armor. Because Beowulf was naked when he's when he fights Grendel, but draws arm, his forearm, there's his chest. Now this other arm would be back here, so we're gonna draw this other sh back shoulder like this, coming down, and then here's his chest, like that. Now let's draw his hands. There we go. Like that. Let me see what's going on here. Yeah, there. Uh, if you if you haven't read Beowulf, uh, it's I would say read it. It's pretty. It's not very long. Uh, however. If you like audiobooks, which I really like audiobooks, uh, I can't remember his name. 
off the top of my head. I'll pull it up, though. But remember the guy in Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade um, where the guy that's... was J- Julian Glover. Julian Glover is his name. Uh, on Audible, and this is... I'm not sponsored by Audible, but uh, on Audible, he has a reading of Beowulf, and it's like an hour and a half long. Uh, but he reads... It, it's an English translation, and he does an awesome job. And it's great. And so if you've never read it or, or heard it, I think that's a great, um, that's a great place to start because it's awesome. And I really liked it. And I was listening to it before I started tonight. So just to kind of get, get in the mood. I'm pulling up this border right now. I just want to draw this hand. I'm going to draw these fingers kind of really boxy and square tipped. Because I want it to look really gnarly. There we go. This weird spacing between the index and middle just to make it more, more weird. There we go. I don't like that thumb. Let's draw that again. All right, I'll come back and fix it. That would go in, in front. There we go. Some veins or whatever. Some knuckles. Oops. There's this forearm, elbow. And then his bicep. <coughs> Excuse me. And then it rips off. I don't know how we're going to do that, but it's going to be cool. Some guts and bone with the little lines. All right, let me see here. I mean, there's really not much to it. I mean, it's really easy to get, like I was saying before, just telling that story. There's not much that you got to tell because you can really get the meat of the story with just a few things. And I think that that's, a lot of times, that's the way to go. You can say more with less visually. All right, so I'm going to delete. Let me find this. Make that invisible. Okay, got him there. Let me duplicate that. Bring this back. Okay, so let me just fix it up here. Let me fix this up. We're done. Okay, good. I have enough time to kind of start it, so that's good. All right, so there is my base drawing. Let me just draw his back here. Yeah, whatever. That'll be all right. Okay, so now what I'm going to do, I'm going to open up, let's see, my textures, my textures folder here that I've got all my textures in. Textures, textures, too many folders, too many folders, textures. All right, textures, wood. All right, I'm going to open all these up and just show you what I got. All right, these are kind of the things that I'm working from. Um, I like this one. It's kind of got this uh, bleached kind of pale gray color, which I really like. And I'll tell you why in just a little bit. Uh, I've got this one. I like this one because it has less figuring in terms of like the wood grain. Like this one's got some like knots and stuff. And I wanted to find something kind of in the middle. Like I think this is what I think this is the be, is going to be the one that I'm going to use only because it looks very similar to all the little the wood carvings <clears throat> and stuff that I've been looking at. I like this one just because it's very. It looks like wood, but it's very, very uh, simple, and it allowed me to do a lot of drawing. However, it doesn't have very much wood grain, and I want it to look like wood. I like these other ones that I got, but the problem with these is they're just they're just too dark, I think, uh, and they're just not going to show up. And when I if I you know if I print this, especially with a, a a drawing on top of it, 
once this gets printed CMYK on on paper, it's just going to look really dark. And so that's kind of why I've landed on this. So it's it's kind of a mix of simple, uh, but it's got figuring. So there's some things like knots and stuff in there, but it's a light enough value that it's going to give me a lot of room to uh, you know paint in the modeling and stuff for the the characters. So I'm just going to copy that. And please know that this is me just experimenting. Uh, I'll kind of go back once I've kind of got the direction and really, really hone in on what I want and how I'm going to do it. So I'm going to bring back the opacity here, bring back my dye line. Then I'm going to paste that wood texture in the back. And I'm just going to rotate it just like that. I'm going to center it up right in the center. All right. Control D to deselect. Control Shift bracket to bring that to the front. All right. Where's my pin? There it is. All right. So what I'm going to do here is uh, I'm going to first start with my border. I'm going to take Beowulf off. I'm going to bring back my border that I can see it. And I'm just going to create, I'm going to roughly paint in the border. And so you have to think about this like, uh, if I look at this picture here, this kind of line right here, that's the border. And so this is kind of be the carving, the wood carving that's going to hold everything together. So this will be like the border of the card. And so I'm going to bring down the wood texture a little bit. I'm going to bring down this. And then I'm just going to make a selection uh, right here. Like that. Select it. And then I'm going to select, deselect this. There we go. Now I'm going to bring this back up. I'm going to save this selection because I know I'm going to come back to it. Save selection. I'm going to call it border. Now, this is a really this is gonna be a really simple. Uh, the way I'm gonna approach this is, I have the wood grain texture that's gonna be my base, and then I'm gonna add a shadow layer, uh, which is gonna kind of establish all these kind of background shadow areas, and it's gonna bring bring the figures off the background, and then I'm gonna create. Once I've done the shadow layer, I'm going to uh, create. Uh, I'm gonna create. A highlight layer that's going to bring out the foreground and I'll show you how I'm going to do that right now with this border so I'm going to take everything off just so you can see what I'm doing take the dial line off okay so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start with the highlight layer just because I've already got it selected now I'm just going to take my I'm just going to go with a light colored I'm going to fill it with white, just like that. And put that on overlay. And then from there, uh, I'm just going to blur. I'm just going to blur some of the edges here so it's not so, so crisp and digital. And one of the things that I'm going to do, uh, like I'll just establish the drawing and then once I've done all the cards and all the drawing, then I'll go back and then really look at the background texture of the wood grain. And then I will kind of like draw that into the, the design so it looks like it's getting carved into this very wood. So now that I've got that, I'm going to select that layer. I'm going to control shift I to inverse the selection, make a new layer, put it on multiply. And this will be my shadow layer. I'm going to select me a dark color there. I'm going to control H to hide. And then I'm going to pick me a, a round brush. Make it a little bit bigger. Like that. Okay, good, 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 good. I'm bringing down the flow way down. And then I'm just going to paint in really lightly kind of a shadow layer to bring this part forward a little bit. And this is very, I would consider 
this like my rough draft of how me figuring out how I'm going to do it. All right, I feel good about that just to start with. Now let's add, let's add these cross pieces here, make a new layer. Uh, and then I want to make it this, I'm going to make it half the width of this piece here. I'm just going to fill that with white. And then I'm going to put it where I want it. I want to put it right there. Okay. I'm going to select that, make it invisible. Oops. Let me check something here. Normal. Ah, that's why it looks like that, because it's not white. This color here. Fill. Overlay. Good. Good, 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 good. Bring that back. I'm going to rotate it over to the other side. Good. Oh, there we go. Select. Fill. Good. There. Now we've got the two border parts. I need to make sure that that... There we go. Sorry, people. I need to make this on this layer. Sorry, I'm just kind of roughing it in here. All right. There we go. We've got the beginnings. I put this layer on top. Now I can turn off my my line drawing of this border because I know where it's going to be at now. And then I'm going to go back to my multiply layer and paint in that shadow layer here. Oops. Multiply. Oops, I got on the wrong layer is what I got. That's no good. All right, now I'm going to bring back my drawing of Beowulf. That's the original drawing. I want the tighter sketch. There we go. I'm going to shrink him up a little bit to fit him within this boundary. Now, pull up my reference. Okay. Merge these layers. Bring it down in opacity. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to come in here. I want to look at this guy's head while I'm doing this just so I can see it. And then I'm going to bring it over here. And then basically what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start painting white. I'm going to start painting white on top of the background texture. And that's going to make it look like, or the idea is it's going to make it look like Uh, it's coming off the background. Sorry, I'm going so slow. Just make sure this is the same color. There we go. I promise I'm not this boring all the time. All right, so overlay, new layer, overlay. I'm going to make sure my, my pen or my brush is hard-edged. And then I'm just going to, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to lock uh, or like block in the main shapes. And maybe I'll do, what I'll do is this. Just so you can start, kind of see and get a good idea of what I'm going to do. I'm just going to do his head to show you what it's going to look like. And I think that you'll get a really good idea of how it will look. And I think that you'll be as excited as I am. Well, maybe, I don't know. I'm excited. So now I'm just blocking in that shape of his head. There we go. Fill it in. Anybody asking questions? See. <laughs> All right, there we go. I'm going to bring down the opacity <clears throat> on my line drawing. Uh, 
even further. All right. So now if I look at this reference image, you can kind of see right here that it's, I mean, there's like two or three layers, two or three levels that create the depth. And so it looks like this hair, the hair here is the top layer. And so what I'm going to do is first, let me see here. Okay, I'm going to bring down the opacity of this just a smidge. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to duplicate this layer. I'm going to make it invisible, the one that's in the bottom. Then I'm just going to erase. And this is kind of what I was talking about. I'm just going to block in the shape. And I'm, what I'm doing is I'm thinking about, okay, if I was carving this out of wood, which parts would be this top layer, okay? And so from this, I know that this level, the level I'm thinking about right now that I'm blocking in is going to be like the hair level. So this is where it's going to be the hair. And then uh, if you notice, his mustache here is going to be on top of that hair level and then also his ear. So I'm just going to go ahead and duplicate that again. And I'm going to come in here and erase the level of the ear because I know that I want that to be on a higher level. I probably don't even need to do that. I can just paint it. It's probably just as easy to paint. All right, I'm going to select that. Looks like I didn't paint it in all the way. There we go. Erase all that. Good. Select. And then bring this layer back. And then I'm going to delete from there. So now what I've got is I've got his hair. Oops. Oh, my, my mouse is. Oh, something's happening. There we go. My mouse is not happy today. So I've got his hair on this layer, okay? And then I've got his face on this layer. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in here. I'm going to just label it right quick. Okay, this is going to be face, and this is hair. I'm going to group this. I'm going to name it head just for Okay, good. Now what I'm going to do is I want to pull off the mustache. So I'm going to make a, a draw selection here. Control X to cut. Control Shift V to paste in place. Overlay. Okay, I've got the mustache. We'll call that stash. Uh, and this may seem pretty... <clears throat> Very simple and boring. <clears throat> but this is really going to help me. I'm establishing a process and a process of way I'm going to do this. And that's very important with anything like this because if you establish a process, you establish kind of like a rule set for yourself and a process of how you're going to do something. And especially when you're doing something like this that is kind of an artistic style, you want to have a process that is repeatable so that all of your drawings look cohesive and it like the same person did them or like the same art style or whatever. And so I'm trying to create a process. Now that's the ear. Now what I have is I've got his face. I got his face here. His hair. His ear and his stash. And the great thing, the reason why I did that is now when I want to paint into a specific thing, I can just control click his face and it's got it selected. I can paint on it. I can control click his ear and it's, and it's selected. And I can always go back to that and not have to worry about reselecting something and it'd be a pain because it'd, be it'd be a pain. So now what I'm going to do is I always want to have the background layer visible so I can see it because it's definitely going to interact. It's definitely going to interact with how the final image looks. So I want to make sure that it's always visible. And that's a big part of this whole style. Going back to 
those two pillars of storytelling and community. This doing the storytelling the right way, I want it to have a style, and the style is this kind of wood carving. So I want to make sure that I really capture that. So what I've just done now is I have selected his whole head, and I'm going to inverse the selection so that I'm going to paint that shadow layer. This would be what's white would you was is what you would consider like the highlight layer. Now I'm going to paint the shadow layer. I'm going to hide my selection, control H, make a new layer, multiply. Now I'm going to select a dark color here. I'm going to get my uh, brush, make it very, very feathered, bring down the flow. I want to turn off I want to turn off shape dynamics and pin pressure off. I want it to be one size. So now bring the flow way down so it's barely even. So now I'm going to paint this shadow layer behind it. Like I said, I'm just doing the head right now just to kind of give you an idea of what it might look like. And this is also just kind of to, to establish it for myself. There we go. So now I've got that shadow layer. And then it's going to look very rough and blocky in the beginning. And then at the very end, it's kind of like anything with art. 95% of it is just like blocking it in. And then that last 5% is like the bling or the icing. And it's what really makes it pop. And in, in this case, it's going to be really what makes it look like a wood carving is that last piece. So now I'm going to select the face because now I'm going to paint a shadow on the face to establish that hairline. Because you can see in this piece, this drawing here, there's this, uh, that little shadow right there that creates the hairline. So I'm going to uh, go right here, make a new layer, multiply, and then I'm going to lightly paint in this shadow layer right here to establish. And I want to think about where my light source is coming from, and so we're going to do like from the top down, basically. Like that. Now I can go in and then you kind of just kind of erase the shadow a little bit. Like that. And then I'm going to blur it on this edge a little bit. I'm going to blur it a lot more here because it's going to fall off that shadow. And then I'm going to blur it just a little bit on this edge because this wood is not going to, I mean, this wood is, you know, you think about it and this wood is like really, really old. And so it's not going to have like a nice, sharp, uh, sharp edge. I'm going to make me a new layer, multiply. I want to select my face again, so I'm just painting on the face part. I'm going to make my brush hard again. Then I'm just going to draw, I'm going to draw this eye. And, I'm, and with this, I'm really going to tell, I'm really going to tell what it looks like in terms of form with shadow only. I can't really think about trying to draw lines because they didn't really have, this would be, this is a carving. And so I have to think about the shape in terms of the shadows that are being created. At the bottom of the eye. And I'm looking at this reference over here just to, as I'm doing it. There's that part of the eye. And there we go. Let me take, turn off my drawing. Now I'm just going to come in here and uh, use my blur tool, my smudge tool, just to like smudge out some of these edges and to kind of get them, kind of get that kind of shape that I want.
Yep, 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 yep. <clears throat> Looking good. I like it. Now, notice how this is very much lighter. I know that in the final, I know that I'm going to really push, and it may be one of the drawbacks that I have with this uh, wood texture that I'm using, is I may want it to be a little bit darker. I may want it to be a little bit darker in the end so that I can establish more kind of a, a contrast in the light and dark areas. Now, I can go back in, like I would end up going back in and really darkening some of these areas to really make them pop. Go and this line would come down here. Gonna blur that edge a little bit. <clears throat> and like I said, I'm just like roughing it in, kind of feel it, feel it come together and see how it's gonna work. Bring this hairline down, the beard. So his nose will be here. Going to create a shadow over the mustache like that. And then the mustache is going to come in like this. Cast a shadow on his bottom lip. Maybe not that much of a bottom, not that much cast shadow. There we go. And then this will come, let's see, where do I want this to meet? I want to meet his stash. Like right here. Give us a line right there. And then a line there. And then for his hair, you know, it's kind of hard. It doesn't look like that they have, they have like lines right here that go down. And so I'm just going to kind of rough that in. Really kind of sketchy. Just bring it down. Oops. Like this. And I can already tell that this is going to be like a... I'll probably like... This will be like a second rough sketch. As I'm blocking in the forms more... Uh, you know, more tightly. And then I'll probably make all this invisible and then draw over it one more time when I got everything, like, blocked in the way I want it. Let's connect that line. And then his beard will come down like this. Actually, if you see these lines, they kind of come down from there. So let's do it like this. Let's continue this line just for flow. Like that. There we go. Liking that. Good, good, good. Yeah, I like that. It's going, it's getting where I want it. Now from there, what I can do is I'm going to bring, I'm going to put all these shadow layers on one layer here. Let me find it. Okay, there's the ear. Let's put those on multiply. Bring down the opacity. Uh, and then from here, uh, it's already 10 o'clock. So, and this is kind of what I'm talking about. Once I kind of start roughing in the shape, now it's very blocky right now. And it doesn't necessarily look like it's a carved wood. And now what I can do from here, and this is a long way from being what it's going to look like. But I just want to give you, a, I just want to start showing you what I'm thinking. So when I look at this, I want to look at this wood grain in the background. And if I make a new layer, I'll just draw it red. You can see here, uh, the wood grain is like this. Okay. And wherever the wood grain is, I want to use that to like really sell the fact that this is... Um, carved in wood. So what I'm talking about is I would come in here with my smudge tool and like 
where the wood grain is, I'm going to like smudge the drawing up to where it breaks that edge almost. I might even erase it. It might be even better for me to erase it. So I'll start erasing that wood grain into the drawing like that with that wood grain. So like the carving is coming into that. And I'm sorry if it's hard to explain. Like that, there we go. Yep, 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 yep. I'm liking this. It's gonna be good. And then come down the nose. And then that would allow me to then I'm just I'm this is very all rough because I want to show you guys what I'm thinking about my process here. What I can do now is create me another layer. Let's go even darker. Mon multiply. Then I can really draw into it that wood grain to like really sell. And like where I'm gonna look at the wood grain. And then where the wood grain crosses like those shadow areas, I can then really just I can really start to like work in those sh shadow areas with the wood grain as I'm just following that wood grain. So it can I say wood grain more? Maybe I could probably say wood grain more like that. And then let's let's block in this eye a little bit more. So we come down here. Can have a shadow there, like that, and then see how that see how the 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 direction of the wood grain turns there. I'm going to start turning that shadow to match that wood wood grain. Let's say it more. Rough in his eye here. I'm doing this super, super rough, people. Cut me a little slack. And then I can come on top of that to really drive it home and add a, just a shadow layer. Maybe, maybe not. Let's see. I'll probably end up bring the opacity down. Bring the opacity down a little bit here. And then, let's see here. Overlay, brush, make it white. Make a new layer. And then, I would do this for a while, and then I would go back in with white. Uh, bring the opacity a little bit. And then I would just, like, hit it in certain spots, like right here. And on his forehead. Just, like, really bring out some of the areas that would be higher uh, in, in terms of, like, on the carving. Like, it would be, have a highlight on his mustache. And then on his beard here. Then I would just blur some of those edges. Like that. This is pretty harsh. Harsh contrast. It's gonna I can already tell that it's gonna take a little more a little more finesse to really make it uh, really make it feel. But you can already tell. I mean, obviously, it looks very rough when you're zoomed in, but anything looks rough when you're zoomed in. But you can already tell kind of like when you zoom out, I mean, this is like the size of a playing card at print. 
So when you really zoom out, uh, all those kind of lines will come together. Let me find this layer again so I can draw on it some more. see here I'm just I want to do a, a few more lines just so we can get the really I want to try to get the head roughed in pretty good so you guys can really see what it's gonna look like I'm really trying to go fast here yeah this will be I'm just gonna rough this in real quick then because I, I want to answer I want to try to answer a few questions. Just a second. Shouldn't take me that long. Good, 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 good. Add these, add this for the forehead piece. Just keeping, you know, I'm just keeping mind of where that, the direction of the grain. And it's kind of one of those things, it's like, um, I mean, doing this, I mean, a lot of this you're not going to even see, because it's going to be so small. But I think it's, it's these little kind of details that in the end really, will really sell the kind of style of this wood this wood carving kind of idea that I'm going for. I'm not going to do the hair because that'll take me, that'll take me like 10 minutes to do all that hair. But what I do want to show you is from that point, anything that would be carved would kind of, that's beveled would have, well, not really beveled. Anything that's carved would have like a highlight edge on the ridge uh, and that it'll just help it really make that ridge pop and so I'm just going to add this highlight and it's going to be really bright white at first but you will see and I'll add it to these parts that I really want to pop out but it's going to make this it's going to make this these carved edges really look like they're carved I don't want to draw a line because that would not look good. So I'm trying to I'm trying to vary up my line width and such. So each on each edge I want to have and notice how I'm not doing on the top up here because the light source is coming from up here the edge of this carving that's going to be hit, getting the edge of light is this uh the light facing edge the light facing edge of the carving. Kind of like that. And then, okay, okay. There we go. Really slick. I mean, really, really rough here. Add some here. Add some on his cheek. Because I really want that to pop. Add some on his nose. And then some on his forehead. Super rough. And then some on his ear, because that's going to be pretty highlighted. And then just a few right in here on his beard. Now, and right here on his cheekbone as well. Bring down the opacity a smidge. Now when I zoom out... All that stuff will come together and look more. It always looks really rough when you're zoomed in. That's a, that's just part of it. But then when I zoom out, uh, all that all that color value difference will really come together and form a really cohesive uh, drawing. And I think one more thing, just to make it, 
is on the shadow areas, what I'll probably end up doing is like, let me see, adding the similar thing, but with dark lines. So imagine going with the wood grain, these dark lines that are help, that help reinforce both the wood grain and also the the shadow layer of that carving. And I think now that I'm thinking through it and going back to what I was talking about in terms of like developing a process, the way that I think I might do this now that I'm thinking about it, just going through these different steps, I might, I might paint the whole thing, the whole design in almost like a grayscale relief with no, uh, with no wood grain behind it in the beginning, just like a, a black and white grayscale. And then pull that in, pull that in, and then start working with it that way, and then start painting in the, uh, the textures and stuff. Maybe, we'll see. I'm just going to duplicate this just so you can kind of get an idea. And then I already can tell that uh, I like this wood. I like this wood texture. I like the bleach, kind of bleachness gray of it. But I know that I'm going to, I know that I want to add, uh, I know I want to add some richness to it. And so what I might end up doing is taking one of, uh, one of these wood textures. Uh, let's see. And I might kind of, on top of, I don't know, maybe, we'll see what it does. Just kind of like that, where it adds some like warmth, warmth to it. I could desaturate it a little bit. But that'll just add a little bit of warmth to it. You can see on and off. And it also is going to, it's also going to bring in, uh, you can really see like in this area here, it just brings in a little bit more texture. A little bit more texture into it. All right, let me see here. I'm going to come over here and answer some questions. Let's see. Uh, okay, I'm just going to start from the bottom because that's where I'm at. Uh, okay. Why you work? Probably a stupid question. Any reason why you work in Photoshop versus Illustrator? Because you can't do... Because you can't... You can't really do this. You can't really paint like this in Illustrator. Uh, you don't have the freedom and uh, intuitive nature in Illustrator. Uh, I mean, there's definite, definite benefits to Illustrator in terms of like creating vector, vector art, but... So much of what I do, I would say, you know, 90% of all the decks that I create, especially ones like this that take, that have to be some type of style or artistic look, you just can't, you can't, you can't really do an illustrator uh, because it's, it's vector based and not image based. Uh, let's see. How am I going to, how am I going to, Separate the suits? That's a good question. Uh, and I'll show you. I probably will use some sort of color. So let's look at this. But it's going to be in a way, and I've thought about this a little bit. I'll do a spade and a heart the way I think I'm going to do it. So, oops. So let's say here's my spade. Uh, I'm just going to fill it with uh, black right now. Or like a dark gray. So this is my spade. I want to think about it like it doesn't need to be like fresh paint because you know the idea of this is that this is really old. And so imagine that this is uh, like hundreds of years old, and the paint is all but all but worn off. And I'm just going to blur some of these edges like this. Now I'm going to come in with the eraser. And I'm doing this very, very rough. Well, actually, it wouldn't. The, the paint would wear off 
on the high spots, not the low spots. So I'm just going to come in here. My eraser is way. Uh, what I probably could do is find, find some wood that has actual old like barn wood or, or paint on it. But I'm going to, I'm just, I'm, I'm using my blur tool to blur this in the high spots, looking at the wood grain underneath. Like that. And then, let's see here. And then I'm going to bring the opacity down a little bit. And then I can just take one of my mini brushes over two decades of working in Photoshop. Let me see here. I'll just take one of my textured brushes. Let's see if that one works. And I'm just going to erase some of it so it's not so solid. Where'd it go? I have too many brushes. Should scale down. I have a problem. There they are. And just lightly erase. Just to give it some texture. And so now... Obviously, like I said, it looks bad when you're zoomed in. And then I can do that kind of same thing where I can add that highlight. Uh, of white. Onto the carvings. Like this on that wood grain. Like that. You got to just work through it. You got to you got to be okay with it looking bad when you're zoomed in because you got to know that when you zoom out that all those colors and contrasting values come together to make the image that people's brains put together. Now when I zoom out, it kind and you can kind of see that wood grain in there and then the same kind of thing with the heart, let's say We'll fill that with like a blood red. Put on multiply. And then do that same kind of thing where. Uh, oops. Great. I need this to be. I totally blew it with my smudge tool. Smudge. I need a basic brush. I was looking at all these brushes and it messed up my thing here. Where's my general brushes? There we are. Yep, that's the one I want. Oops. Oops, I didn't like that. There we go. Let's bring down the hardness. And then do that same thing where I come in on those high spots. Bring down the strength a little bit. It's a little bit too much. Like that. And then the goo. At first I need to fix this. It was a little bit too much. A little, little too heavy handed on the old smudge, the old smudge brush there. Erase. Oop, a little bit too much. Too much. Too much, too much. And then let's do that uh, overlay on a new layer. My brush. Uh, new layer, overlay. On that wood grain, don't worry, don't be scared. I know it's bright and white, but I'm gonna bring it back. I'm just gonna go on the edge of that, that light facing edge on the wood grain. And I might, I might make everything that's red. I mean, I can already see it now. I might make everything that's red look like it's blood. So 
And that would be easily achieved by just like making me a new layer, picking me a blood red and like adding like, like splatters of blood. Like it's, I don't know. I mean, it's Beowulf. I mean, it's people dying and such. So now you can kind of see of what it's going to look like. And notice how, I don't know if you can see it on your monitors, but just notice how, uh, um, like when you're zoomed in, like these little edges that are going with the wood grain, it looks bad. But when you zoom out, it really, at least I think it does, it really kind of sells the fact that that paint or that blood or whatever that is, is on that wood. And it just subconsciously, your brain kind of puts it on there. And let me tell you this, uh, the relying on the viewer's brain to put things together visually is way more effective and uh, thought-provoking than if you try to spoon-feed them everything visually. Um, I know this may be a bad reference, but you know Spielberg, when he made Jaws... Um, like you were, I mean, at least I was when I was a kid when I watched it, you were scared to death of that shark, the whole movie, but he doesn't even show the shark. Like for the first two thirds, if not more of the movie, he just gives you enough. He just gives you enough of it, enough of the idea of the shark, but never shows it. And your brain creates the shark in your head and that image of that shark in your head is way more uh, scary than what he could have shown you, especially in the 70s, uh, what he could have shown you. And that's very much, that's very true in art. Like so many times illustrators will, or, or artists will want to like, like draw every detail and make it and like try to make it perfect when they just need to give, uh, and that's, that's very true with like figure drawing and like trying to like create shapes and forms like with this with this guy's face, I mean, it's just like a couple of shapes and a couple of, a couple of you know lines, but when they zoom out, you get the idea. I don't know if that was kind of a weird way to get to that idea, but I think that's something important for artists to know is that more is not always better. More detail is not always better. Uh, having the right the right strokes and the right um, shapes in the right spot is sometimes way more effective in evoking an image than it is you trying to like really put the detail into it. Let's see here. Uh, let's see. Let me try to go back here. Zach, this is for November's deck for Beowulf. I'm going to, <clears throat> what time is it? 1028? All right. I'm going to pull, I'm going to look at the chat and if you have any questions that Parker didn't answer or he couldn't answer, I'm gonna try to go. I'm gonna try to answer any questions that you have. Let's see. <laughs> Justin, new drinking game. Take a shot every time Jackson says wood grain. Let's see. Uh, I don't know how you can work on so many decks with the unique style. Uh, I think it's just practice, really. Being able to work on different styles is just practice doing a lot of different styles. Uh, all right. Does anybody have any questions not drawing related? Sorry, but any members only drops this week. Uh, I don't, I, I don't know if there are any member only drops this week. I know that we have the uh, pops deck release on the 21st, I think. And I know that the members are going to get early access to the pops deck, but I don't always like talking about date specific things on the YouTube live because it kind of puts it out of context for anybody that wants to watch it like in five years from now. So, but, so I try to keep it brief on that kind of stuff. Uh, let me see. Any other questions? Are there any other questions you find people have? Uh, I'm excited about this deck. I really think that this is going to be, um, um, the, one of the things that I'm excited about this deck is I had, I had a blast doing Robin Hood. And I think, uh, even though I have, even though I've done a bunch of different decks and a bunch of different styles, I really feel like that I am most excited and most pumped up when I'm doing something that's like 
archaic, ancient stories, uh, especially like medieval stuff. Maybe that's why I like Lord of the Rings so much. I don't know. Uh, and I'm just kind of coming off of that excitement of Robin Hood is one of the reasons why I wanted to do this deck as well. But the, the, the thing that I'm excited about is that it's in a very different... I mean, it's not fabric and stitches like Robin Hood was, but it's in that state... Uh, uh, it's in that same vein of of Robin Hood, that kind of style, but on but in the carvings. Let's see, pops. Uh, let's see, B Dog asks who is going to print Beowulf. Well, right now, uh, Expert Playing Card Company is going to print Beowulf only because, uh. Even though the United States Playing Card Company is open, a lot of there's still a lot of unknowns with timing and printing that I don't know yet. And I'm very, very I want to get ahead, and so I'm kind of going with what's what's solidly available to me right now. And Expert Playing Card Company is solidly available to me right now, and I like to be safe. Uh, especially just with the, the deadlines. And I've been very pleased in recent with like VHS, Robin Hood, Legal Tender. I've been very pleased with the uh, flexibility that EPCC is giving me to try some weird stuff and different stuff that that United States Playing Card Co Company just can't do. Let's see here. Uh... Zach, I can't wait for these future releases. My wife and bank account are not very happy with all the purchases, but they'll be fine. Looking forward to getting the reserve note. Yes, I'm excited too. Robert asked, how about some one-off actual wood carvings? Oh my goodness. Robert, relax. I can't do one-off wood carvings. That would just be, that would just not be good. However, I am, <clears throat> I am thinking about I have been looking into this because I've been wanting to do something. I've been wanting to do something more kind of like fine art related, like with like prints or pieces that like go on the wall. Uh, um, and I have been looking into these, doing these like really intricate, <clears throat> taking my designs, like playing card designs and stuff like that and making these really intricate like um would like the these laser cut I mean they're big but like laser cut carvings that are like you know 10 12 layers deep that just create this really visual visual depth these wood carvings that are laser cut one layer on top of each other with all my car designs and I've been looking into that and doing some research I'm pretty excited about that and I'm trying to I'm testing some stuff out let's see well I did I mean you say but a wood carved King's Wild logo that would be cool <clears throat> I did do, let me take a drink of water. I did, let me turn the camera back on. Let's see. I did do, um, um, I did do a wood carving, a block wood carving of, of the King's Wild logo when I was doing my woodcut print t-shirts. Uh, and I think I've got a, uh, let me see. There's a video of that. On my YouTube channel, obviously you're there now, but don't leave. Uh, let me see my channel. If you look at my videos, uh, there is a time lapse of me doing that wood carving. Here it is, uh, right here. Let me turn it down, but this is me doing a wood carving of uh, the King's Wild logo that I ended up. Uh, mo making a print for the shirt. So that's as close a thing that I've done to a wood carving. Ooh, look at that, breaking the third wall. Oh, you can't see my screen because I'm not sharing my screen because I'm an idiot. Here we go. This one right here where I'm doing this carving of the King's Wild logo. And this is just like an MDF board. I don't know if, if YouTube doesn't like this, where I'm showing YouTube on a YouTube Live, whatever. But it's on there. Take a look at it. Let me see here. Let me go back to the questions. 
Is the tip jar still on the site? Right now, it's not on the site. Uh, we're still working through some new stuff uh, that we're that we're kind of implementing on the back end. So the tip jar is not currently on there. I think that's about it. It's ten thirty-five. If you guys have any more questions, please ask them. I'll try to answer them. Let's see here. Uh, since you're using EPCC, can you uh, incorporate foils into Beowulf? Uh, I think that the short answer is yes. Um, I don't want to incorporate foils just because I can, because I think that that's novelty, and I, I, uh, uh, I don't like doing that. I think if I were to incorporate foils, it would be some sort of, very much like I did with Robin Hood, where all the gold, all of the gold threading or all the gold fabric ends up being foil. It may be something similar where, <clears throat> excuse me, like all the gold elements are painted gold or something like that. But I don't know if I want to do that or not. Only because, like, it seemed like it was a mu it seemed more of a no-brainer with Robin Hood because of, like, the illuminated manuscript and golden thread. And I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's an easy, because all these wood carvings, they didn't really have, they didn't have paint. Uh, they didn't have much paint. They didn't have uh, any gold for the most part. But the Sutton Ho helmet has gold. I mean, it has gold on it and stuff like that. So it's a possibility. Uh, I might do that. But I'm not going to do it just because I can. Because um, I, I think that's feature creeping, and I hate feature creeping. Uh, when, you, when you do something just because you have it and, it, and, you, and you don't think of it in the bigger, the bigger scope of your style and your, what you're doing, and I, I try to run from that because I think a lot of car designers do that now in terms of they build their entire artistic style around a feature like foil or, I don't know, neon paint or neon, neon ink or something like that. And they build their art style around a, f a feature. Uh, and I don't like that. I try to stay far away from that. But there is a possibility uh, of me using gold. Uh, I may... Well, you know, like looking at, let me share my screen again. You know, when you look at the Sutton Ho helmet, let me go back to it. Reference images. When you look at this, I mean, there's obviously gold and silver. <clears throat> and at that time, uh, at that time, uh, gold wasn't as prevalent as silver was. And at that period of time, silver was really the currency. And so, like, um, you know, you know, pay your weight in silver or whatever. And so that's why there's a lot of silver on this helmet because that was really the currency at the time. It wasn't so much as gold because just gold wasn't as prevalent. And so I think that if anything, this might be where I use the foil, like on the back design. So let's say, and I'm thinking through, I'm thinking through all this stuff for the first time as I'm talking about it. So maybe that the faces are the wood carvings and then the back, the back design is more derived and inspired by this Sutton Ho, uh, Sutton Ho helmet where you have golds and silvers. Uh, and that would be a good place. See, that's a good, that's a good example of like the style and motif lends itself to using it instead of you trying to design just to use it. So I think there's a good a good possibility of me using, you know, foils for the back, just because of this Sutton Ho helmet. Let's see. On average, how long does it take you to complete a deck, start to finish? Um, I don't know. It depends on the complexity of the illustrations and the design. Uh, but I would say on average. Uh, like when you put it all together, like work time, on average, it probably takes, uh, I would say, t one and a half, two weeks, I think. Um, and that's like 
me getting up and working eight. Well, I don't work eight hours. I work more than that. That's like me drawing pretty, pretty nonstop. No, I mean, not nonstop. Just one and a half, two weeks of solid work, work days of me drawing. Um, and that's, a, I mean, that's probably pretty accurate from what I did for like Robin Hood. But then you have like things like Lord of the Rings where it may take me three days to do one card. And so that, that kind of deck is going to take me a lot longer. Uh, I see all these decks that took one to two years to finish, but you seem to fly through them. I don't know. I can't, I don't really compare myself to other people because I think other people, everybody has different situations and stuff like that. Um, I do think it's kind of hilarious when I see like, when I see a deck of cards, it's like a solid background and it's like a letter or something simple. And they're like, it took, you know, this, this deck has been in the works for three years. I'm like, whatever <laughs> it's, that's, it's, they're just trying to hype it. Uh, but like, there's so many different people have different situations and, um, uh, different skill levels. Um, uh, you know, and I've been, you know, I was an illustrator professionally and an artist professionally for a you know a decade before I started even uh, doing playing cards, and I've been doing playing cards now for seven years, and so uh, I just I just have a lot of practice, and so a lot of practice equals faster, more efficient work. Um, yeah, and I also think that I also think artists a lot of times, especially card designers, they just they try to make everything too perfect. And, and, um, uh, I think so many great artists never create anything or they create very little because they're, they're always, they're getting, they're getting roadblocked by perfection. Uh, when my mentality has just always been to try to create as much, just to try to do as much work as I can to get more practice. Let me see here. Let me answer some more questions if you've got them. I think that's about it. It's about 10.45. We've been here an hour and 45 minutes. Um, anyways, I'm pretty excited about this. I really like, I like, I like where, I like where, uh, uh, I like where it's going. This is very, you know, this is very rough right here, but I like where this is going to go. I can tell that this is going to be, uh, one thing I'm going to add, and I kind of do it, I've kind of like started doing it with this spade, but a lot of these stave churches, uh, the, uh, the state, like the, the Scandinavian stave churches. And also they do this in Japanese architecture a lot and other, in other architecture, they would, they would literally burn or set, set parts of the building on fire, like the outsides and that's why a lot of these stave churches are black. Let me see if I can find a picture. Because the cauterization of the wood created like a natural barrier to the elements. Uh, here's, a, here's a good example. Like a lot of that black is not necessarily paint, but a lot of that black is just like them... Uh, you know, you know, cauterizing it, burning it in a way. Well, they don't burn it up, obviously, but they create a layer of protection of that carbon on the outside of the church or the outside of the wood, and it creates a kind of a natural barrier. And they would also like, you know, like use pine tar and pitch, very similar to what they would do on... Uh, you know, like the bottoms of their boats and stuff, just to create, using natural processes to create a natural weather barrier. And so I may do that. I may try to use that kind of thought, like with the the black stuff. So, you know, we talked about, um, and, that, and, that, and, that's, and that's a way to think through it. Like thinking like, okay, everything that's black, like spades, the spades and clubs, Everything that's black is going to be that kind of burned, charred wood. 
like they use in the stave churches. And then everything that's red, hearts and diamonds, everything that's red is going to be blood, you know. And so that's a way that I can kind of stay true to the style and straight stay true to what, you know, the art, you know, the the architecture. Because they didn't have much paint. You know, they're not going to put a bunch of colorful paints on there. And I think that's a way that I can stay with the style and the art and still make it feel good. And also, and then at the same time, make it a functional deck. Uh, a functional deck in the sense that, you know, the spades and clubs are black and the hearts and diamonds are red. Okay. I have enough talk. I've talked enough. Uh, I really appreciate you guys coming. There's 20 of you on there right now. Uh, I appreciate you guys being here. Uh, I really enjoy this. This is the third or fourth week that we've done this straight. And I'm just trying to, I'm trying to keep doing it. Uh, I'm trying to keep doing it so that it just creates a habit for myself because I really like doing it. I really think that, I hope that you guys enjoy it. Um, and you, and I, I hope that you guys get to see kind of my process behind the process. And so thanks a lot for, uh, tuning in. Thanks for asking your questions. Uh, be on the lookout, uh, this, this week just for new stuff. And as we, as we come up with new stuff. And uh, I don't know what we'll work on next week. Uh, we may work on this. We may work on this deck, or we may work on the Halloween deck, just depending on what we uh, what we get in terms of stuff back. So I don't know. So hope you guys have a great week. Uh, you guys are awesome. You guys uh, are why I do all this stuff, and also because I love to do it. So, but I appreciate you guys. Thanks a lot for joining us, and have a great week. Uh, see you guys later. Goodbye.